But thank you, Matt, John, and especially Dwayne uh, this evening. Thank you so much. Uh, we continue with this topic, democracy, republic, or theocracy. And where I'm coming from is that Christ rules the nations now. Now, you're either a willing subject of his or you're a rebel, but that doesn't mean he doesn't rule. Think about this. It's said all the time. Um, well, it's said in Scripture. O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. Question. Is the name of Christ, is the name of God, is his name excellent in the earth? Yes. Well, then why do people take his name in vain? Because they are rebels. See, the fact that people take his name in vain doesn't change the fact that his name, his name is excellent in all the earth. And the fact that people are rebels against Christ doesn't change his kingship at all. It just makes them rebels. Remember one of the last things he said. All authority is given to me in heaven and earth. Now think about that. He has no less authority on, in, in he, in, on earth than he has in heaven. He's king here. Well, tonight, I want to continue with this, with this topic, uh, democracy, republic, or theocracy. It's great to be here tonight. I wonder if you've ever considered why politicians lie so often. Now that we're talking about republics and democracy and whatnot. And whether or not the people that vote them in actually approve of the lying when their guy lies to get his thing, of which you disapprove, does that upset you? It should, but when your guy lies to get this thing of which you do approve, when he lies in your favor, does that upset you? It should, but does it? Know this, when you approve the lies of elected and appointed civil magistrates and officials, know that you are part of the problem. No matter what it is, if you approve of their lies, you're part of the problem at that moment. You're confirming the act of a public lie. I want to talk to you tonight about the problem known as dualism. The idea that the God of the Bible and even the God of the universe speaks only, if not merely, to the spiritual and immaterial realm. I want to challenge that tonight. This is being taught in our churches, in our Bible colleges, in our theological seminaries. How many times have we heard this? We're not going to speak about society here in church. We only preach the gospel. As if the gospel has nothing to do with society. Let me ask you a question. Uh, here's, here's one for you. We have prohibitions in the scriptures constantly about dishonest weights and measures. Do we not? That's, that's, that's a constant, constant thing. Is that an abandonment of the gospel? It's like, it's, it's like you know, God writing like, okay, you know what? We're talking about the gospel here, but let's divert from the gospel. Let's talk about dishonest weights and measures. There's all kinds of things that are taught in the scriptures, all kinds of things that we need to know and we need to obey. And there's lots of things said to society that we need to know and that we need to obey. Now, I want to take you... Um, on a trip tonight, but before I do that, I want to talk to you about a young man who, um, let's just say, he was a, um, he's the greatest man who ever lived. He was a fairly young man at the time that he died, and some of you know who I'm talking about. I'm talking about John the Baptist. How do we know, how do we know he was the greatest man who ever lived? And, and, and you're right, uh, the, you're exactly right, Dan. The Bible says he is the greatest man who ever lived, at least up to the time of Christ. But do you remember who it was that actually said it? Jesus. It was Christ. Now, that's quite an endorsement, isn't it? Christ said that John the Baptist up to that time was the greatest man who ever lived. Now, I want you, I want you to listen to what happened here with John, okay? Because he had this little... Had this little um, little contest or little interaction with this guy named Her Herod. You ever hear of Herod? Not really the best guy. Not really the guy you would like, I would hope you would vote for. I'm afraid we voted for worse though, perhaps not the folks in this room. But anyway, here's the thing. John was a man who annoyed Herod. Herod was annoyed by John. And here's the thing. Listen to this verse from Luke chapter 3. 
But Herod, the Tetrarch, being rebuked by him, John, concerning Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, and for all the evils which Herod had done, also added this above all, that he shut John up in prison. Now think about this if you would. Herod puts John in prison for two reasons. One, because John got in his face about his brother's wife. Remember, Herod stole his brother's wife. What a piece of slop. And John let him know. Stop for a second. I want you to think about our pastors, our theologians, our book writers, our conference speakers. What would they say to John the Baptist right now? If that was happening right now. If we had... A the, if, we, if we had a, a man like John the Baptist getting into the personal life of a very powerful politician, what would our people say about that today? <laughs> That's the ultimate offense, is it? Isn't it? That's not very nice. Hey, John, 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 John. Pull him aside, right? John, John, look, look John. That's not the way to win over Herod. Uh -huh. You know, John was not concerned about winning over Herod. He was concerned about telling him the truth. And not only that, it says, and for all the other things that John did. Now, John was not a two-kingdom guy here, right? Can you imagine Herod if John's a two-kingdom? You know, there's a kingdom of heaven. This is the dualism I'm talking about. That God only d d deals with the spiritual. We can leave everything else to the Canaanites. They can run everything else, right? Can you imagine that conversation? John goes to Herod, and John says, Herod, you can't have your brother's wife. And Herod says, John, I really appreciate the traditions that you come from. <laughs> and, you know, I'm very sensitive to your background and your teachings regarding these things. But you see, I'm the Tetrarch here. And, you know, your spiritual thing, do you do your spiritual thing, but has nothing to do with me and my spiritual thing? Do you think John would go for that? Of course he did not go for that. He told Herod that it's unlawful to have his brother's wife. And you know what? It didn't matter what the law of Rome was. It didn't matter what Herod's law was. It meant nothing. Do you and I understand that the laws of man when they oppose the laws of God, mean nothing. Nothing. More on that a little bit later. I want to take you to, through a, I, I, there's a lot more I'd like to say about that, but that's, um, you know, we, don't, we don't have enough time for that. I want to take you through the journey of a man named Jacques Ellul. I don't even know if I'm saying that correctly. It's a French type name. So you know, uh, <laughs> You already know, right? When I said it's a French name, we got problems, right? Okay, I'm just, just, just kidding a little bit. My last name is Saint, which is kind of Frenchish. So, uh, so what? What am I saying? Okay, Jacques Alul was a was a Frenchman, bright guy, and I found out about him in the book that I have up with me tonight. It's called, and I recommend the book highly. It's called In Defense of God's Law, by Jean-Marc Bertou. Jean-Marc Bartou, in his book, gives a, a, a rousing defense of God's law as over everything, as Matt was talking about. Some law is over everything, isn't it? We can have the word of God or the word of man. Now, I have to address something here before I get into Jacques Ellul, and that is this. What happens when someone like Matt or someone like myself or, or others get up and say, you know what, God's law tells us how to live in society. It's really clear. And someone's going to say, but, but I, I go by the natural law. You've probably heard that, right? I said, it's the natural law. Well, what does the natural law actually teach us? You, you see, here's the thing. When we say, I go by the natural law, whatever that is, the natural law is kind of nice, isn't it? It's pretty elastic, is it not? It's kind of like whatever I want it to be. <laughs> it's definitely silly putty, right? When we say I go by the natural law, then what happens is the re revealed law, God's law, becomes the book of divine suggestions. Mm -hmm. 
But when we go by revealed law, then the natural law becomes the suggestions. Just, you see that? You see how that works? You see that? Now, what happens is, is this. What happened is this. You need, you, please understand this. Adam and Eve in the garden, right? Everything's good. Plenty to eat. Plenty to do. One law. Count them. One. One. Don't eat from that tree. By the way, you can eat from any other tree. Don't eat from that one. Now, you'll recall that Eve then has a better idea. She looks at the tree, and the scriptures tell us she saw that it was good for food, pleasant to the eyes, desired to make one wise. Yeah. Now, you see what happened there, and then she took the fruit and she eats. Now, think about this. If Adam and Eve, in the Garden of Eden, and they had everything right, perfect, it's never going to be better than that. If they need re needed revealed law there, revealed law, don't eat from that tree. If they needed it, don't you think we need it today? I, if they needed it, I'd say we need it a whole lot more. But Eve substituted the natural law. Did you, see, did you hear that? That was natural. She did the natural thing. Hey, look, it looks like it's good for food. It's desired to make one wise. Why not? We need the revealed law of God. And that's what we're talking about here tonight with theocracy. That's what, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about the wonderful, benevolent rule of Christ. What can be better? What, what, who else dies for his people? A horrible death like he died. Would that not be the most wonderful king you could ever have? Jacques Ellul. He studied Karl Marx. He had some kind of a conversion experience. And he tried to fuse Karl Marx with the Bible. He says this. He says, in fact, Christianity did not appear to me like an explanation for the world. It must not be forgotten that at the time the essential debate of Christians hinged on individual salvation. It was a purely personal affair. How many times do we hear this in our churches, our theologians? It's just a personal thing. Who are you to tell other people how to live? You know what? I, 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 here's a news flash. I, I'm nobody, but the eternal word of God is actually written in heaven, and it does have something to do with you. It is authoritative over you. But he is having trouble because he believes Marx at the same time. So what he's beginning to do, can you see what he's begin, beginning to do here? He's saying, you know what, I think I can do the Christian thing personally and the Marxist thing publicly. Does this sound like anything you might be familiar with? Let's go on in Jacques' journey here and we just have a few quotes. He says, in these conditions, the development of my thought could not be otherwise than dialectical. Either I would be stuck at the point of this tearing, and I became literally schizophrenic. <laughs> My friends, in our churches today, i got to tell you, we are preaching a schizophrenic gospel. Wait, wait, it's happening every Sunday? We aren't going to talk about society here. Well, wait a minute. Doesn't Peter tell us he's, uh, Christ has given us everything for life, life and godliness? Yeah. Don't we cut that short? We've given, been, been given everything for godliness, but not about life. Got to get that from someplace else. Life and godliness. Well, poor Jacques is trying to work it out. And he's becoming, he says, literally schizophrenic. Then he says this. He says, I thought that there could be a dialectic link between the Bible and societal, society. To a problem posed in sociological terms, a Christian answer does exist, but in terms of a dialectic counterpoint. So I tried in 1943 to establish an outline of what could be a work of insight on contemporary society with theological counterpoint alongside. Once again, it was not about giving Christian answers nor solutions, which would be absurd. Now, my friends, that's, that's where we get to here. Once Once we decide 
that the Bible doesn't speak to society, once we have that decision in our minds, what happens next is when someone like Matt brings up the idea of a, of a biblical response or a biblical answer, it sounds absurd. Because we've already decided the Bible doesn't speak to this. It sounds crazy to us. That's why theocracy sounds crazy to us, does it not? It's crazy. We've already decided that Christ isn't king. We can't have that. Oh, he's king in some sense, but he hasn't given us any laws. What's a king without laws? Are you kidding me? So he's uh, going down the road here. It's uh, a tough spot that he's winding up at. We'll um, end the, his uh, discussion here. He says this. He concludes this, does Jacques Ellul. There's no possible continuity between action led by man on earth and the establishment of a kingdom of God. Nothing we can do has anything do, to do with the kingdom of Christ. Nothing. Why? Because Christ isn't king here. It's kind of funny to me. I'll just say this. We talk a lot, a lot of modern theologians, pastors, talk about the fact that the founders of this country were deistic. They were deists. You know, they were thought God was far away from his creation. That's really bad. I have a question for you tonight. What's the difference between them and what we have now? Besides personal salvation, I, I would say we're more deistic today than what they were. A lot more deistic. Shame on us for that. Your average pastor in the pulpit this coming Sunday, your average theologian, if asked after the service, what does God have to say to society, to the political sphere, I promise you, you will get a very short answer in most cases. Now, I am ripping a lot on pastors tonight, but please know that it's not just here. I'm an equal opportunity offender. <laughs> this morning, I had an opportunity to talk to the Lancaster County Commissioners. I get an opportunity to do that every Wednesday because they meet in, in publicly and they have an open mic. And um, I take advantage of that. I try to keep it to three minutes, which I do. <laughs> Unlike tonight. This morning, I talked to him a little bit about, about the laws of man, the rules of man. Yeah. We don't want that horrible theocracy, I know. I didn't talk to him too much about theocracy. I said, but this is, this is the absurdity of where we've gotten. And, you know, if, as a pastor, it's, it's getting easier and easier to point out the absurdities, right? I mean, it used to be more difficult. Now it's like all you got to do is like, if you're a pastor, you're going to be talking about the absurdities of following man's law over God's law. All you really need is a pulse. I mean, it's just everywhere. And, you know, and I talked to him about a, um, a statement I saw recently. And here's the statement. And you'll recognize this kind of thing. We hear it all the time. Here's the statement. A trans woman is a real woman and a trans man is a real man. That's... That's almost like gospel nowadays, right? And I said this morning to the um, commissioner, I said, you know, I said, we now have a Supreme Court justice who can't define a woman. But apparently we can define a woman. It's a trans woman. So here we are. The only real woman is a person who used to be a man. That's where we are. Think about it. A trans woman is a real woman. Chief Justice Kachanji Johnson, J Jackson, excuse me. What's a woman? I don't know. I'm not a biologist. Uh, you, you know what? I'm going to tell you something. As a pastor nowadays, to be maligned and impugned as a nutcase is an absolute compliment in this mess in which we find ourselves today. Well, ending up here with dear Jacques Alul. He says, my thinking has been that the world is separate from God. And he says this then, a morality of you shall and you shall not is anti-Christian. Is that not, I mean, so we, we, we look at this and we say, what's, what's he talking about? Is he crazy? But I want to be clear tonight. 
That is mainstream Christianity today. The Bible just tells me how to get to heaven. It doesn't tell me anything else. I have great frustration as a pastor because I feel like I say these things and people don't understand, they don't, they don't get it. So let me turn to something perhaps somewhat contemporary, somewhat not. You heard tonight from Matt how the people in Israel, they decide they want a king to be just like the other nations. What a bad move. They had God himself, the pillar of fire and a cloud protecting them from the sun. I have a good idea. Let's be like those other people. Burning their babies to Moloch and Baal and so forth. My friends, if we decide that we don't want Christ to rule us, just like the Israelites decided that, then we're going to wind up just like the Israelites. Captivity. Idol worship. Destruction. Don't think that God cannot destroy this nation. Open your eyes. He seems to be well on his way. With our cooperation, by the way. And you'll notice every single time when God leaves his people, it's because they chased him off. Adam, Eve, they sin in the garden. God is the one that comes looking for them. They're not looking for God. He's looking for them. And they can't get far enough away from him, my friends. That's us. That is us. We hear a word like theocracy, the, the rule of God himself, and we're like, oh, no, not that. You know, um, when you get a chance, look up some YouTube videos on Argentina. Argentina was a thriving nation at one time. When I was, when I was young, even. Thriving nation. Today, it's a total basket case. Constantly, you know, technocrats messing with their, with their um, uh, currency, new currency, inflation all the time. Complete disaster. A beautiful country at one time. Rivaled the United States of America at the time. We're I'm talking about back in the 30s and the 40s. Rivaled here. And it's interesting to watch these politicians stand up and promise the people all kinds of things. And then as soon as they get in office, go back on what they said. And in one of the videos that I saw, there was a man, a, 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 a political science professor, and he just said, look. He said, this is the way it is. People need to understand. If you're gonna, if you're gonna rule as a politician, if you're gonna serve as a politician, you've got to lie. It's part of the job. Machiavelli said the same thing, did he not? Machiavelli the prince, did he not say that? He said, you must never, if you're in a position of political leadership, you must never keep your word if it'll cause you to compromise your power. Do whatever you have to do to keep your power. And that obviously includes law. My friends, how do we get out of that? What's our escape from that? More democracy? More republicanism, if you will? New guy to vote for? How many times have you even... It's, it's a motivated group here tonight. You're motivated. You came out, I know you're motivated. You came out in this weather to hear this. I guarantee you're motivated. And you've probably worked for a politician from time to time. And how many times have you been let down as soon as they get in office? You know what? They're following their ethic. What's right, what's wrong, says who? Hey. There are plenty of people who say, you know what? Get an office and lie your way to keep that office. Lie your way into the office and lie your way to keep it. My friends, that's, that's, that is reality, my friends. Well, I wanna, I wanna wrap up tonight. Some of you, maybe my age, um, might remember the uh, British band called The Who. Mm -hmm. who, remembers, who remembers The Who? Some of you. Thank you for all you... You don't remember The Who. You're way too young. Oh, okay. All right. All right. All right. Okay. All right. <laughs> you have the album? <laughs> okay. Seriously qualified. Yeah, remember their song, We Don't Get Fooled Again? I want to talk about that song, that, that song just a little bit as I, as I wrap up here tonight. 
Because sometimes pagans can identify the problem. They can't identify the solution because the solution is found in Christ. They can't. But let's listen to them identify the problem. We'll be fighting in the streets with our children at our feet, and the morals that they worship will be gone. <laughs> that didn't take long. Three lines. We already got the compromising politicians. And the men who spurred us on sit in judgment of all wrong. They decide, and the shotgun sings the song. Now, here's the key. I'll tip my hat to the new Constitution, take a bow for the new revolution, smile and grin at the change all around, pick up my guitar and play just like yesterday, then I'll get on my knees and pray we don't get fooled again. Now, there is some real insightful lyrics right there. Yeah. Just listen to this. Uh, I'll tip my hat to the new Constitution. <laughs> new Constitution. Might be good, might be bad, whatever. Got a new constitution. Now this is after fighting in the streets for the new constitution, don't forget. How many times have you gone door to door, knocked on doors, supported someone? Let's see. Uh, take a bow for the new revolution. Smile and grin at the change all around. Pick up my guitar and play just like yesterday. See, we've been through this before, haven't we? And what's his answer? What's his answer to this, revo this revolution stuff where we have somebody new and we hope it's going to be better, but it's not? You know what his answer is? Pick up my guitar and play just like yesterday and get on my knees and pray. We don't get fooled again. Again. My friends. Oh, yeah. I'll get on my knees and pray. To who? Or for what? Yeah. It's intriguing, he doesn't say what he's going to pray for. He doesn't know. You see, he doesn't have Christ. He doesn't have the law of God. What does he have then? The latest word from man. Congratulations. As I watch these Argentina videos, it's amazing to see the basket case the country became. And yet when the politicians stand up and give their speeches, all these people are, are, are cheering and yelling, this is great, oh yeah, a change that had to come. It's a change. It's going to be better. I don't know how familiar you are with the French Revolution, but that's what they made guillotines for. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, what, do you, what do you do when you have to kill people fast? Mm -hmm. And lots of them. Yeah. Well, some genius comes up with a guillotine. And I've read a lot about the French Revolution. One of the things that struck me was that you had, in the beginning, you had the, in the beginning you had the wealthy, right? We all know they need to be killed, right? And then after a while, it became other people. Anybody here wear glasses? You're next. Because they were obviously from the non-working class, right? Because the poor people couldn't afford glasses, so enough of them. And then they were checking people's hands. Did you know that? They were looking at their hands. You know what they need, wanted to see their hands for? They have, they have calluses. Yeah. No calluses like mine. It's because I was washing dishes today. Actually, that was yesterday. Uh, no calluses. Off with his head. My friends. The French Revolution was welcomed with cheering crowds. And these cheering crowds, and this is what I want to talk about here, these cheering crowds would, would, would cheer when they were dragging down the rich people and the people with glasses and the people with calluses on, without calluses on their hands. And then after a while, they started dragging down the originators, the purveyors, the promoters of the revolution itself. And you know what's odd about it? The same crowd was cheering each new beheading. Smile and grin at the change all around. Pick up my guitar and play just like yesterday and get on my knees and pray we don't get fooled again. <laughs> You're guaranteed to be fooled again and again and again if you decide that theocracy is a bad idea and God's law is irrelevant. Mm -hmm. All you have left, my friends, is to be fooled again and again and again. That's it. I love the end. 
the fans will remember the end. At the end, they sing. Once again, I'll tip my hat, take a bow, smile and grin at the change all around. Pick up my guitar and play just like yesterday, then I'll get on my knees and pray we don't get fooled again. And then, of course, that last line. Meet the new boss, same as the old boss. If you don't get the right boss, you're going to have the old boss again and again and again. Now, you're going to say, Pastor, what should we do? What do I do? What do we do about this? In my own case, in my own case, I'm blessed with a few grandchildren. The Bible said, I have children and grandchildren. The Bible clearly says that I have a responsibility to teach them the law, word of God. When we rise up, sit down, we walk by the way, when we lie down. Do you even know what God's law has to say to society? Do you even know? If you don't know, you've got to find out. You've got to read it. That's the first thing. Learn God's law. Micah 6, or the scriptures tell us, what does the Lord require of you to do to love mercy? Do justice, walk humbly with your God. Do you know what mercy and justice look like? It's defined in the scriptures. You have to know that. Get familiar with the law word of God. Read it. Study it. Ask questions about it. Secondly, a little more personal here. It's bad form for pastors to say what I'm about to say. But better men than I have said more than what I'm about to say. If your pastor at your church will not address what the Bible has to say to society, you need to have a talk with your pastor. Now what's happening right there is that, this is what's happening at that point. Either you're going to convert your pastor, fat chance, or your pastor's going to convert you, maybe just as fat a chance, and then you'd have to decide what you got to do. Yeah. The, my friends, the times, the, the country is burning down around us. This is not a time when we can play games in church and act as if we can waste time there. We need to have a pastor who's going to tell us the unvarnished, straight word of God. And if we can't get it, we need to find a place where we can. The, 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 the times demand it. There, may, there was never a time when we could play around. There never really was a time. But now it's really obvious. We can't play. So those two things, and, and I, I want to say, and then there's one third thing, as I, a third thing as I mentioned earlier, and that is, we, I mean, we want to learn the Word of God. We want to go to a church where the Word of God is taught as it applies to all of life. And then we need to find someone that we can teach. Do you know that if we... Can you imagine the effect that you could have if you could... Do each one, reach one, each one, teach one. If you could teach just one other person for a year, for a year, and that person taught someone else for a year, and that person taught someone else for a year, can you imagine the impact that your teaching could have? It is unimaginable what could be done. That's not, it's easier said than done, my friends. It's sometimes hard to find that person. But pray and work for someone to teach the law word of God. My friend John here is fond of talking about Sam Adams. We'll say this in closing. And Adams talked about the, the revolution. And people asked him, how did you get it done? And he said the revolution took place in people's minds. Right, John? John, John, did I say Sam? Excuse me, John. <laughs> Sam, John. John Quincy. Yeah, Sam was, Sam was more the uh, crazy, uh, he was almost a crazy guy. I, I love Sam Adams. Okay, it was John Adams who said, it started in people's minds. That's where it started. I said the things I said tonight, to get the revolution started in your mind. 
Christ is king. We're not getting anywhere until we all recognize that. I want to thank you for your time here this evening and your kind attention.